and we have also the very first mentioning of an indian outs uh, in, in outside of india which is there in a court case which happens in sumeria uh, in which you hear about a court case where a about a drunken brawl so in this drunken brawl what happens is that this meluhan uh, 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 punches a local in the face and breaks his teeth in a drunken brawl and then he is asked to play, pay a fine of several silver coins so uh, since this meluhan was probably very likely a gujarati uh, it may well be the source of prohibition in gujarat now the question there arises is what were the indians importing from the middle east and this is a big big controversy this is also true by the way about what they were trading doing with the central asia because we have just like the middle east we have lots of signs of the uh, indians were trading with central asia so if you go there are places in tajikistan and so on where they we have also found harappan outposts and they were clearly again exporting all kinds of things including beads and things like that so they were clearly a export oriented economy but still they must have been importing something and there's a lot of controversy about what those imports were because we have never found anything of either clearly central asian or of middle eastern origin in any harappan site now it's possible that they were importing consumables like dates or wine or something like that but one intriguing possibility is that they were there to import horses because we know that horses were being used by the by the bronze age uh, Uh, in both uh, Central Asia and in the Middle East, so although there aren't any Harappan sites, seals with the horses, clearly in touch with civilizations that were using horses. And more recently, in certain sites like Sarkoda, etc., in the in uh, Gujarat, uh, horse bones have been found. So the Harappan was unaware. Here. May I request uh, uh, people to switch off their uh, mute their search because I can hear too many people. Kindly, uh, can you mute yourselves? Thank you. So now, what happened is very likely you had horses coming in. Now, you may assume that the horses would have mostly come from Central Asia, but in fact, we have now a lot of evidence to suggest that the horses. Were originally not from Central Asia at all, from what is now Arabia, because uh, the earliest signs of human uh, and horse interaction appear in paintings in what is now in the middle of Saudi Arabia and the deserts of Saudi Arabia. Remember again, climate was different. These were all savanna lands, and it turns out that the horse is not a northern but a southern animal. In fact, many many things that have been that were assumed to be Central Asian wild horses. Genetic studies now have shown that these are not wild horses at all, but descendants of ancient horses that had escaped from uh, uh, from uh, human uh, tamed uh, groups of horses. So these are not directly wild horses, but in fact feral horses. So again, it's quite interesting that maybe our entire thinking about where horses came from, where they were tamed, etc. As we look from a much more southern source, and very likely from what is now Arabia. So, given that is the context, it is very likely that the um, Arabs are importing their horses. Now, in this context, we need to think about where do you fit the the uh, the Vedic texts. For this, you need to know how the Harappan civilization ended. The Harappan civilization and the Sumerians, all of them, suddenly all came to a grinding halt around about 2000 BC. Now, the reason they all suddenly came to a halt was because of a couple of hundred years of extreme drought that hit all these civilizations at the same time, and as a result of which, we know the climate change was the key reason why these civilizations all collapsed. Now the Harappans, we have now more than adequate information that you can see that 
there as these great Harappan cities collapsed, they were also going through a phase where um, the, 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 the cropping patterns changed. They moved from wheat and rice to growing more millets, uh, which were clearly requires water. And they moved to much smaller communities. So there's no sudden break. Rather, what you have is a slow decline of these large cities into smaller cities and smaller communities. There's a breakdown of municipal culture, but there is continuity of culture. So this is clearly not a invasion or sudden change in behavior, rather a slow decline of a couple of centuries. And it clearly coincides with climate change. Now, when this climate change is happening, there is also a breakdown in trade patterns that I talked about, because obviously these great voyages that the Indians were making was based on an urban culture. Now, as the urban culture broke down both in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, by the way, as well, uh, it also broke down, by the way, in the Jiroft area, uh, which was uh, an important, uh, it's in southern Iran, and was clearly linked to to, uh, uh, to uh, Harappan. Uh, you see all these cities break down, and so you see also Dholavira and all these cities all get abandoned. So this entire trading culture broke down. Now, in this context, the question arises, where does the Vedic texts fit? Now, it's very interesting here that when this culture broke down, the Harappan culture broke down, it coincided, of course, with the entirely, the, the entire um, Ghaggar river system drying up. Now, this is important because the Ghaggar is, uh, is a very, very important uh, to the Harappan civilization. There are far more sites on the Ghaggar than there are, in fact, on the Indus. So, in fact, uh, and so the question is, is such a river mentioned in the Vedic texts? And the answer is absolutely yes. The Saraswati River is the most important river in the Vedic text. It is mentioned much more often than either the Ganga or the Sindhu. It is also in the Nadistuti Suptam clearly told where it is. It is between the Sutlej and the Yamuna. Now, that is leaves only one high riverbed, which it, it has to be the Ghaggar. The, the, the Ghaggar. There is no question about it. It also fits with the fact that it was clearly had a large community living around it. As I mentioned, you know, the largest city, cities of the Harappans like Raki Gari, etc., are along this Rai river bed. We know that this river went all the way down to Gujarat. We know that the Dholavira was at the the um, was near this uh, the estuary of this river. Clearly, this river was very important to this culture. So, uh, the, it is very clear that the Vedic civilization was a part of the Harappan civilization. Now, I want to make this point clear: is you see, what do you mean by Vedic civilization? If you mean by it the people that are clearly described in Rig Veda. Then let me also say that the Rig Veda is, first of all, largely deals with a subset of the Harappan. It's not about all the Harappan, it's a subset. <coughs> it deals with a tribe called the Bharatas who lived in and around Haryana, what is now Haryana, and maybe some part of eastern Punjab. They, they were they lived in an area land that they themselves called the land of seven rivers or Sapta Sindhu. This does not, by the way, this is a landscape very mistaken mm -hmm. is usually taken as five rivers of the Punjab. It did not include the five rivers of the Punjab. The it relates only to the Saraswati and its own tributaries because it is very clear from the text that all the seven rivers flow into the Saraswati. So it does not include the Sindhu or its tributaries. So where is this landscape? This landscape is essentially, as I said, Haryana uh, and a little bit of Pan Eastern Punjab and some bit of Northern uh, 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 northern parts of Rajasthan. That is the landscape that you're talking about. The importance of this Rig Vedic culture is that it mentions the first empire that the Indians ever built, which was built by a tribe called the Bharatas led by a chieftain called Sudasa and his guru called Vashishta. And it mentions that it fought this great battle against this alliance of ten kings from coming in from the west, from western Punjab and Afghanistan probably, whom they then defeated on the Ravi. And they defeated them. So that is basically the sum total of what we know about this. We also know that then 
Sudas turned eastward and defeated a tribe led by a chieftain called Bheda on the banks of the Yamuna. And therefore, he created this first empire. Now, the interesting part is that this empire was uh, set up by a tribe called the Bharata Tritsu tribe. And it's quite interesting what they then did is that they then did not impose their own gods on all the other all the other tribes. They were obviously worshippers of Indra. But what they did is they compiled instead the Rig Veda, which is actually a compilation of the all the tribes of that time, including the defeated tribes. And if they compiled all the ideas, the religious uh, texts and, and, and ideas of all the rishis that were known at that time and compiled into the first into Rig Veda and then it grew into the four Vedic texts. Now, this is why it is interesting because this is essentially the template of Indic civilization in that in this, if you read the very last shloka of the Rig Veda, it mentions come together, sit together. Yeah, it's called a Samanas system. And it talks about how all the tribes were asked and all their gods were given a place around the fire, around the sacred fire. So this was the first, not only creation of the first empire, although it was originally set up based on uh, military power, what the Bharatas did then created a template for assimilation, which then expanded over time uh, and kept incorporating new areas. So even when the tribe itself may have gone into decline, the idea was so powerful that 5,000 years later, um, I I am a Bengali. I come from clearly don't come from Haryana, uh, but I consider myself a Bharata because um, I my ancestors bought into this idea of assimilation um, as opposed to imposition. So this is why this idea comes directly from the Rig Veda. But here we are talking about, we are not getting into that line of debate. I'm just giving you a sense of who these people were. But what they do is they mention this river called the Saraswati. And they very clearly mention that this river was in full flow from the mountain to the ocean. Now, we know from ground surveys and uh, now many, many uh, surveys of oxygen levels in groundwater uh, and um, so on, that this river uh, Ghaggar had already begun to uh, stop being a glacial fell, uh, run river by 3500 BC. Uh, and that uh, by around, two, uh, it was still, uh, by the way, a very substantial river after that because the rains were so heavy. So it was still a pretty substantial river, but it completely dries up by 2000 BC. Now, the Rig Veda, since it mentioned a fully flowing river, was 100% had to be composed before 2000 BC while the big cities were still there. But it seems to have been composed in an even earlier era because by the time the big Harappan cities were composed, the river had already begun to uh, go into decline, which is mentioned in the Puranic text, but not in the Rig Vedic text. So suggesting to me that we are dealing with a text that is before 3200 BC, because that's when roughly you already begin to see the river begin to dry up. So you are really dealing with the Rig Veda is actually an early Harappan text or maybe even a pre-Harappan text. So you're dealing with a civilization that was not yet building large um, uh, cities, but you know probably just about beginning to urbanize because there are cities mentioned in the Rig Veda, but they don't seem to be the large Harappan cities. You're really dealing with a very early text. However, since there is a lot of controversy about horses, let me also tell you in this context, the Rig Veda is very clear about one thing, which is the association of the horses with the ocean. It does not associate the horses with Central Asia or the mountains as it would have been if there was something they associated northward. Instead, the horse is something they associate with the south. Um, again, the link with Arabia. Uh, the Ashwins, for example, are the twins, the horse twins. And the Ashwins come from the sea, they rise from the sea. Uh, 
This is clearly an allusion to the fact that horses had an allusion to the ocean. They were not again this makes absolute sense because if you just look at a geographical book this whole idea of Aryans coming from the north on chariots is utter rubbish because even if they were driving chariots in Central Asia by the time they went through the mountains of Afghanistan the Pamir North the Hindu Kush and then went across the several rivers of um, Punjab I can assure you everybody would have abandoned their chariots and uh, without roads, taking your horses through the Hindu Kush would not have been fun. And they would certainly have had zero uh, military advantage for the simplest reason that uh, there is no point in uh, using horses in a mountainous, uh, using chariots in the mountainous area. And the horses we are dealing with are clearly very small. Horses really became big in the medieval period. Early horses were very small animals. Uh, not much bigger than a mule and consequently they were not capable of uh, dealing with a, ho a horseman sitting on the horse earliest uses of horses were all with chariots because of this reason um, <clears throat> and so uh, you are you are dealing consequently uh, the vedic people were almost certainly pre harappan they were almost certainly a subset of a wider landscape this is very important just because we have a great Affinity to the Rig Veda because of religious reasons does not mean that it is the sum total of all the knowledge of that time. It is just happens to be the one set of books that have survived. That's all. There were many books around them that have not survived. Uh, so just because one book has survived, we shouldn't assume that uh, that is the only one. And it happens to be the testimony of an important tribe called the Bharatas, but there would have been many other tribes. So just because the Bharatas are important and we happen to have civilizationally adopted their culture. It does not mean that the, the landscape of the Harappans was somehow had only one culture. They may have shared some of the culture or that they had one great empire. It may have been made up of many kingdoms. Uh, and given the long periods of time, many things may have happened in many cycles along the way. Anyway, by the time we have the end of the of this uh, civilization, uh, by 2000 BC, one important thing needs to be remembered that there were already other civilizations in other parts of the country. So we tend to get an impression from reading of, from our text that, you know, you're dealing with uh, a Gangetic Plains that was essentially empty. That's not true. There were already large numbers of people living in the Gangetic Plains. And it's very likely that cities like Varanasi were already fairly old cities and were contemporaneous probably to Harappan cities. Uh, we now have from a dig in Sanauli, in Bhagpat, in the Gangetic Plains, where we have discovered chariots and so on. So clearly, not only did they have an advanced civilization, they already had chariots, horses, and bronze mm -hmm. weapons, weapons, etc., being used in the Gangetic Plains at the same time that the Harappans were in existence or and were in decline. So the, this already, this is the landscape you're dealing with. Now, this is the time where something very interesting happened in India. Southern India, as I said, we haven't yet found any signs of a Bronze Age civilization. May have existed, it's possible, uh, but we haven't found them. Uh, but uh, one thing is now known is that what we now know, uh, uh, we, 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 we do have clearly some technological capacity existed in Southern India because the next great shift in our civilization happened in the Godavari basin where iron was essentially uh, systematized. So iron technology is an Indian technology and it is a southern Indian technology. Interestingly, the, so the first uh, systematic use of iron anywhere in the world happened in and around Hyderabad. In fact, uh, in Hyderabad campus is where so, campus iron the request of the cover is please uh, mute yourself. Audience, I request please mute yourself. Thank you. 
ones I would request, please mute yourself. It's really disturbing. Please. Audience, please. Admin, you can see who the person is and mute them. That's not a difficult thing. So all you need to do is to find out who is doing it and mute them. We have expelled it. Please continue, sir. Sorry for interruption. So now what happens is that this iron technology spreads from the Godavari Valley into the middle and eastern Gangetic Plains. And you have rapidly expansion of iron technology in the Gangetic Plains in the uh, between 2000 and 1300 BC. Uh, and it's quite interesting that it's only in the Middle East you begin to see the arrival of technology. It arrives with a group called the Mitanni. And the Mitanni turn up with iron technology around about 1300, 1400. This is almost 500 years after it has become commonplace in India. But the Mitanni is also very interesting because the Mitanni are actually of in, they seem to worship Indian gods like Indra, Varuna, and so on. So there's very high likelihood that the Mitanni, who set up an empire in Iraq, Iraq, Iraq um, were actually Indians. Uh, and they built an empire, and interestingly, they ma married into the, they married into the Egyptian royalty, because you see Queen Nefertiti. You may have heard of Queen Nefertiti. She was a Mitanni, uh, and uh, so uh, it's quite likely, consequently, she was of Indian origin. Anyway, so now what happens is that the action clearly shifts away from the the northwest into the Gangetic Plains. And of course, many of the Iron Age cities that were built at that time are cities that we hear about in the epics, whether it is Hastinapur or Indraprastha and so on. Uh, some of these cities, as you know, have survived to modern times. Um, Varanasi may be a Bronze Age city. It certainly is a Iron Age city uh, and became very important. But what you see also is the growth of commerce along the Eastern seaboard. So the area which is between uh, Lake Chilika in Odisha to uh, West Bengal, what is now West Bengal and the westernmost outlet of the Ganga now becomes very active for trade. And you begin to see sites popping up such, such as Chandraketugar in Bengal, just north of Kolkata. Uh, it's near Damdam. And you have these many ports which begin to pop up all along the Odisha coast. And the people of this coast, they begin to now explore the coastline. Now, remember, at this juncture, these Iron Age explorers <clears throat> do not yet know how to cross the sea. They just are able to go along the coastline. And you begin to see these Uriya Bengali sailors begin to sail along the coast downwards towards um, down past the Andhra coast, uh, past the Tamil coast to Sri Lanka. And at some point, they begin to settle Sri Lanka. And it is quite interesting that the people who we now know as the Sinhalese are essentially the descendants of these Bengali Sinhal, uh, Bengali Uriya merchants and explorers who made their way along the coast and began settling it somewhere around the 6th, 7th century BC. Uh, and in fact, the Mahavamsa, which is the national myth of the uh, Sinhalese uh, talks about a prince from, who came from the land of Vanga or Bengal uh, and he comes under the lion flag, which is still the Sinhalese flag, and how the lion people then uh, colonize uh, Sri Lanka. And of course, the Sinhalese language, of course, has very close link to Bengali and Uriya to this day. So, and genetic tests have also now shown the impact of this. So, this is one direction in which these Bengali Udia uh, merchants were sailing. They were also sailing in the other direction. And we know that they were sailing down the coast uh, towards Southeast Asia. Again, remember, they are sailing along the coast. They are not in a condition to sail across the Bay of Bengal. And they begin to visit uh, along the coast the Isthmus of Kra. This is the bit of 
Thailand near Phuket, uh, from which Malaysia hangs off. And would sail there, and from there, they would cross to the other side, which is it's a very small distance, maybe 30, 40 kilometers stretch of land. And then you end up on the other side from where you can sail out towards the Mekong Delta, which is, you know, what is now uh, southern Vietnam and Cambodia and so on. And you begin to see the influence of Indian civilization begin to pop up in that area. Now, there are no Indian. Uh, clear Indian texts referring to these merchants sailing out eastward. But there are many legends in Vietnam and in Cambodia which talk about this period. And they speak of particularly of one legend which is quite interesting about a merchant led by a Brahmin captain called Kondinya. And it, the legend goes somewhat as follows that Kondinya was sailing along the Mekong Delta. We don't know when, but it could have been maybe 5th, 6th century BC. And he was sailing along with a, in a, in a merchant ship um, when he was attacked by a group of pirates, local pirates, <clears throat> and he was able to fend them off. Unfortunately, his ship uh, developed a leak, so he had to then ground his ship on one of the uh, on the land to try and repair it, but when they were doing it, the pirates or maybe a local tribe uh, again uh, surrounded them, and uh, again Condinia rallied his troops to try and defend himself. Unfortunately, things looked quite dire because you know they were completely outnumbered. So nonetheless, they had no choice. So they were trying to defend themselves against this, these pirates. But then luck turned in their favor because the leader of this tribe that had surrounded them was a beautiful warrior princess called Soma. And Soma saw Kondinya and she fell in love. And so she proposed marriage to, to um, uh, Kondinya. Now, I suppose Kondinya didn't have too much choice, so he accepted this proposal and they got married and as a result of this marriage an indianized kingdom called funan was set up in what is now southern uh, vietnam or uh, and cambodia area and this kingdom of funan and this particular marriage would then lead to a series of indianized kingdoms in this part of the world now it is interesting here that for the next 1500 years all subsequent empires, almost 2000 years in fact, all some subsequent dynasties that would rise in this area would try and trace their lineage back to this particular marriage. So obviously whatever happened was very important. Now the question then arises, who was Kondinya? Now we have no idea who Kondinya is. Uh, in Indian records, there is no sign of Kondinya. But we do know one interesting thing. Because Kondinya is not a common name in India, even in ancient times, but it is a Gotra. And this Gotra comes from, from today from the area of southern Odisha, Andhra, and some part of northern Tamil coast. So that coastline uh, from basically from Chennai to Chilika, the coastline is where to this day a Gotra of Brahmins live. Uh, who call themselves Kondinya. So it is quite interesting that this is the region from which possibly, we are guessing, possibly a merchant uh, called Kondinya had set sail. So, um, you know, it's possible that he had something to do with that area. Anyway, now, very, over the next several centuries, trade booms uh, on both the coastlines um, uh, of India. And you begin to see major ports appear. Now, on the eastern side, a very major port appears called Tamralipti, uh, which is now Tamluk, very close to IIT Kharagpur, by the way. And um, it's now that the very few remains of that uh, uh, there. But uh, Tamluk was for uh, almost a thousand years India's biggest port. It was the biggest port of the Mauryan and then later on of the uh, Gupta Empire. And on the west coast, you begin to see many ports begin popping up in Gujarat, all the down the coast, Maharashtra, Karnataka coast, and then of course the Kerala coast, where a very major port called Butchari Patnam began to emerge. 
Now, by now, we are in the first century AD. Now, by the first century AD, one important difference happens, change happens, is that the merchants who are plying the Indian Ocean have by this time figured out the monsoon winds, and they have figured out that this these winds blow in very regular intervals, first in one direction and then in the other direction. So this allows you to sail one way for one season and then say come back to the same place, point of origin, the other way. So in the West Coast, what happened as a result, we begin to see a huge amount of trade happening between India and the Roman Empire. And the trade usually happened uh, with uh, basically traders uh, would uh, sail. If you were a Roman trader, you would sail a set out from Alexandria, sail up the Nile, then you would cross the, uh, you would cross the uh, short distance of the desert to the Red Sea. And down, you would sail down the Red Sea to an island, uh, to past uh, what is now Yemen, uh, to an island called Sokotra or Dweepa Sukhdara, which is what the Indians called it. And from Dweepa Sukhdara, you could have the option of sailing north towards Oman and then towards Gujarat. Or you had the option of sailing using the monsoon winds to sail across to Karnataka, uh, Kerala coast. To or Muzaris, as the Romans used to call it. And why did they come here? They were here to essentially trade Indian products. So what were these Indian products? The Indian products were, of course, spices. This included black pepper, which was an Indian product. But it also included many spices that the Indians were actually purchasing in Indonesia. So many spices that the Europeans called Indian were not Indian at all, but were Indonesian spices that the Indians had bought from the Indonesians and were then selling on to the Europeans. Then the Indians were exporting cloth. Indians, the cotton you have to remember is an Indian plant. And even in Harappan times, Indians used to export cloth and silk. And certainly they were exporting cloth of various kinds, cotton and silk, to the Europeans. They were, as you know, iron and steel was an Indian uh, invention. And ancient world, even in the medieval world later on, would consider Indian steel as being very, very highly regarded. So, so there was a lot of metallurgical products that the Indians were exporting. The question is, what were they importing? Now, they were importing wine. Italian wines were very popular in India. Uh, Greek, uh, Greek olive oil was popular. Um, the nobility were much into importing good-looking women for the harems, evidently. Uh, we are told that. But despite all these imports, uh, it appears that the Indians ran very large current account surpluses with the Roman Empire, because of which the Romans had to keep paying Indians in gold coins. And so much gold and silver was pump coming out of the Roman Empire that the Roman Senate had these debates about how to ban trade with India because uh, the Indians were sucking out too many, too much gold. Uh, this is not a trivial problem because you see, if Indians were sucking out so much gold, it meant that there was not enough gold to print coins in the uh, Roman Empire, as a result of which they had severe uh, monetary squeeze, what would today we would call a severe monetary squeeze in the Roman Empire. So Roman and Romans finally had to solve it by reducing the amount of gold and silver in their coins and debasing their coins. Anyway, so this was going on the West Coast. East Coast, similarly, we had figured out how to cross the sea. And you had these merchant ships that would cross the sea out towards Indonesia. Now, they would not sail directly out. The way Indian merchants would sail out, sail out was that they would set out from the Bengal, Odisha area. They would then sail along the Andhra Tamil coast to Sri Lanka, to what is now the Trincomalee area. And from then, they would sail directly eastward using the ocean current to Sumatra. And then from Sumatra, either they would sail down the Malacca Straits towards Singapore and out towards China and, and Japan and Korea. Or they would then sail further down south along the west side of Sumatra to Java, Bali and so on. And so much trade was happening that... There was a festival that still survives in Odisha called Bali Jatra or the voyage to Bali. 
and this happens on kartik purnima and this is interesting because in kartik purnima is the time at which the winds turn so they turn from blowing from south to north to blowing from north to south because you get the winter monsoons blowing so that was the monsoons that the odia sailors would have used to catch the wind and sail out towards indonesia which is why bali jatra is done at that time and of course this is celebrated to this day because on kartik purnima day um what you have to this day uh, women and children uh go to a water body and they put a small boat with a small lamp in it uh, before sunrise uh, basically what they are doing they are reenacting saying goodbye to their men folk who were sailing out towards indonesia so this is why that festival is celebrated in this particular way to this day so the festival to this day so this was the world we were living in now one important thing needs to be realized that we tend to think of you know indic civilization and trade going outward you have to remember there were, that there was a lot of uh, trade coming in and lot of influence of these coming inwards as well so for example the pallava dynasty which was one of the great dynasties of southern india it is interesting what its origin myths are now most of there is a lot of confusion about how the pallava dynasty came to be uh, established some talk about a chola prince some talk about some ramin who set it up so, and there are many other uh, there is even some legend somebody thinks it may have involved a parthian prince whatever but all these legends all have one thing in common in that they involve a marriage to a naga princess now so the question is who was this naga princess because clearly this naga princess seems to be more important than hill male that she happened to have married because the the <clears throat> pallava seem to have derived their royal lineage from this naga princess not from the male line so who was this naga princess it turns out that the evidence suggests that she was either from northern malaysia or from cambodia so this naga princess was very very likely a princess from southeast asia who married perhaps a local prince or somebody who was a respected person and it led to the foundation of this naga uh, of the pallava dynasty now that was not the end of the link to the pallava of to southeast asia after many generations in the beginning of the 8th century the male line of the pallavas ran out because the king died early and he didn't have he was he died before having any children or at least a male heir so there was a big crisis in the pallava court because now they did not know to become king and they were very concerned that the chalukyas would attack and take them over at this juncture somebody remembered that a few generations earlier the younger brother of the pallava king whose name was bhima and had sailed off to a distant country and had married a naga princess and set up a kingdom so somebody said that maybe we should say somebody should go to this king and see if their bhima has a descendant and then we can get bhima's descendant to come and rule the pallava empire so a delegation was sent from mahabalipura and they sailed to this distant kingdom we don't we are not told where this distant kingdom was but we know it was somewhere across the ocean and they brought back so they when they reached there they found that there was indeed a descendant of bhima and that that descendant was a local prince and he had four sons now the first three sons were asked whether they would want to go back to in, come back to india and they refused uh, they were probably elder children elder sons so they probably likely that they would get some kingdom or something but the youngest one who was only 12 years old agreed so this 12 year old was then brought to india and he was crowned king and he became the pallava king narasimha varman the second sorry nandi varman the second and nandi varman the second would then go on to become one of the most important kings of southern india we know this story incidentally because nandi varman has left this story on the walls of an important uh, temple 
in Kanchi, which was his capital, which is not far from Chennai. And you can go and see this whole story, which has been carved out on the walls of a temple in Kanchipuram. What is, and then he's carved, carved this story out as well. What is interesting, however, if you look at the faces of all the main characters of this story, you will see that they don't look like Indians. Forget about looking like Tamils, they don't look like Indians at all. They look like Southeast Asians. So they do not look like... So the reason I'm telling you this story is that when you begin to hear India's history from a maritime perspective, you will realize that it was a much more cosmopolitan place. There were much more people going back and forth. And it was about a lot more risk-taking open culture than we tend to imagine our past to be. Now, this world, by the 10th century, had evolved into this maritime world, was really the center of world economic activity. So by the beginning of the 11th century, for example, if you asked about the sort of corridor, the, 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 the anchor of world trade, it was the maritime route from Egypt, which was then ruled by the Fatimids, through, through the Red Sea and the Arabian, uh, to southern India, which was then by this point ruled by the Cholas, and then through to Southeast Asia, uh, all the way through to Song Empire in China. This was the trading route of that. A lot of trade was going back and forth between China and uh, the Mediterranean. And of course, the Cholas were at the heart of this trade. Now, what happens is quite interesting, <laughs> is that in Southeast Asia, a lot of geopolitics happens. You see, there are two routes, as I mentioned, to go to China, Japan, Korea, from India, through Southeast Asia. One is through the Malacca Straits, which is between Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula. And the other is through the Sunda Straits, which is between Sumatra and Java. Now, usually the Javans used to control the Sunda Strait and the Sumatrans, which is the Sri Vijaya Empire, used to control the Malacca Straits. Now, what happened is in the beginning of the 11th century, the Javans defeated the Sumatrans and the Sumatrans went and asked for help from the Chinese. So the Chinese provided a lot of backup to the Sumatrans as a result of which the Chinese then pushed out the Javanese from both the Malacca Straits, but also from the Sunda Straits. And suddenly the Sri Vijaya were controlling both the Straits. Now, having taken control of both the Straits, they did what all monopolists do. They began to charge very high tariffs, which the Cholas did not like. And it appears that in 1017, Rajendra Chola sent a fleet to warn uh, the Sri Vijaya, that this, they were not happy with this, but it obviously didn't have the requisite impact. So in 1025, a very large fleet was sent by the Cholas to Southeast Asia, and they went and sacked various Sri Vijaya uh, ports, and finally defeated the main um, uh, army of the Sri Vijaya in uh, Keda, which is a northern um, uh, Malaysia, uh, what was then called Kadara. Uh, this may incidentally have been the original area from which um, the Pallavas had come, because this area also has inscriptions by Nandi Barman. Uh, so um, now, after that, the fleet came back. I want to clarify here that it was a it was a raid. Uh, the Cholas clearly exerted geopolitical presence in the area. It was not an act of a conquest. I don't think we can claim that the Cholas were um, in full uh, possession of Southeast Asia at this juncture. Very often Indians in, in misplaced uh, nationalism tend to try and overplay the history. There's plenty of good things in Indian history, but it is unnecessary to try and overplay what is already a very interesting history. So the Cholas exerted geopolitical uh, uh, influence over Southeast Asia. They did not conquer Southeast Asia. That is a very different, we mean something totally different. Now, this is the world that existed till the 11th century. 
Now, by the 12th century, however, this world completely collapsed. Now, this collapsed due to huge invasions coming in from Central Asia, which destroyed all these civilizations I described. The, Mo the Mongols obviously dis de destroyed uh, China. They also completely destroyed the Middle East and they sacked Baghdad and completely destroyed it. And at about the same time, the Turks uh, invaded India and they completely ransacked India. Um, today, because of misplaced idea of secularism, we very often try to underplay the story of the Turkic conquest of India. But the Tur Turkic conquest of India is a pretty horrific episode in world history. And millions of people would have died. Uh, dozens of ancient cities were completely destroyed. Some great universities were completely destroyed. Um, and there was absolute chaos. Now, this is also important in this context to understand why the sacking of Hindu temples was such a major economic shock, not just a cultural and religious shock. You, in order to understand that, you have to understand that the temples were not possessing such large amounts of gold and wealth because the kings were all handing their wealth over to these temples. Even in ancient times, um, it was very difficult to get Indian politicians to hand over their money. It is true that many of them built large temples to glorify themselves so that they would be remembered. But even in ancient times, I can assure you that uh, Indian politicians weren't handing their money over to certainly not to the temples. Um, the reason the temples had such a lot of money was because the temples functioned as banks. Many of these voyages that I was describing all this while were voyages financed by these temples. And that is why they had so much money. We have copper plates, for example, of how these temples financed infrastructure projects, how they financed, um, you have tripartite agreements between merchant guilds and weaver guilds and the temple to finance production of exportable items and so on. And in this context, again, I want to say that these merchant guilds were what were doing these huge voyages. It was not individual merchants going out. You are really dealing with what are effectively multilateral, multinational companies. Many of them had their own fleets with own armies, and many of them survived many changes of dynasty. So there are, you know, uh, there was a, a, a merchant's guild called the 500, which survived the Pallavas, it survived the Cholas, and so on. So there were these huge merchant guilds, and similarly, there were. Uh, weaver guilds and uh, metallurgy guilds. Uh, many of them we now think of as castes, but in fact, they were guilds. And these guilds were part of this massive trading networks. Now, when the Turkic invasion happened and these bank, these temple banks got destroyed, what happened is that India lost its, its financial muscle. And with that loss, what happens is India goes into economic decline. So although, yes, the other empires happen, it now becomes much more a land-based history because those who conquered India after that were basically coming from Central Asia. They were land-based people. And you begin to see it, the Indian Ocean being taken over by Arabs and by the beginning of the 15th century by the Chinese. So I'm going to now come to the end of my lecture because I'm running out of time. But basically what you have here is by the beginning of the 15th century, the Chinese had essentially thrown out the Mongols and you have the Ming dynasty coming to power. Now the Ming dynasty were very conscious of the fact that they had thrown out these foreigners and they were re-establishing uh, Chinese power. And in that case, in that sense, they were very similar to modern China, were very conscious of this sort of couple of centuries of humiliation, and they were trying to re-establish uh, Chinese dominance. Uh, and one of the things they did as a result of that was send mm -hmm. these gigantic uh, voyages called the treasure fleets to uh, the Indian Ocean, uh, led by, uh, interestingly, a eunuch called Admiral Zheng He. He was a very unlikely person to be leading these because he was a Muslim eunuch from a landlocked place called Yunnan. But nevertheless, 
he led these gigantic voyages and 17 of these voyages over a period, several decades in the early uh, uh, 1400s. And he, these voyages came into the Indian Ocean. They made their way around. Uh, they came to India. They came to Sri Lanka. They went, made their way all the way to Arabia and the east coast of Africa. Uh, there have been claims that they even have made their way to the Americas, but frankly, there is no strong evidence of this, although some authors have tried to make this case. Uh, but nevertheless, these were very impressive things. Uh, many of the ships that the Chinese were using at this stage were several generations ahead of what the Europeans had. Um, so, um, you know, even almost 100 years later, the ships that say, you know, uh, the... Uh, Vasco de Gama and uh, Columbus were using were, um, you know, one fourth of the size of what Jamha was using. So these were huge ships, and there were 25, 30,000 people in each one of these voyages. And these voyages were not, all, these were not voyages of just of trade or of discovery because they were basically sailing in areas which the Chinese already knew. These were well established trade routes which we have already discussed. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, Chinese pilgrims, merchants had been sailing it for generations before that. But why they were sailing here was, as I said, for geopolitical reasons. They were trying to do in some senses what maybe the Chinese are today trying to do in Ladakh or in uh, the South China Seas. And they also began to do many maneuvers of uh, uh, geopolitical nature. One of the things they did, which had lost lasting impact, was that they came in conflict with the Majapahit Empire of the Java. This was then the most powerful um, empire in the Indian Ocean region. The Majapahit were, of course, a Hindu uh, empire, and they had conquered large parts of what is now Indonesia. Now, by this point, the Indians had already gone into decline. and They were not a maritime power anymore, anymore. even though the Vijayanagar Empire would rise. And they would have a lot of maritime trade. The Vijayanagar Empire never had sizable maritime presence. Um, so it was the Majapahit that were really the true maritime power of that time in the notion. And obviously, they came in conflict with the Chinese. So the Chinese did something very interesting. They began to turn the Malays of Malacca against the Majapahit and began to back them. And they interestingly, in order to basically fight back against the Majapahit Hindus, they encouraged the Malay, the Malacans to convert to Islam. So it is with Chinese backing that the Malays began to push back against the Indonesians. And this is the context in which the Islamization of Southeast Asia happened. And slowly the Majapahit basically were pushed back. And the last of the Majapahit, who refused to convert, basically backed up into one island of uh, Bali, where they have preserved the Majapahit culture to this day. So the Balinese are essentially the last of the Majapahit. And they have preserved this medieval Hindu culture uh, that had existed in this part of the world until um, the 15th, uh, 16th century. Now, one would have, if he had come, been, say, in the middle of the uh, 15th century, if you had been wandering around the Indian Ocean world, you would have taken the call that, you know, this was complete Chinese dominance and that the future was entirely Chinese. That, unfortunately, is not how history very often turns out. What happened is that in China, there was a lot of internal politics. As I told you, Jiang He was a eunuch and the Navy was consequently the um, preserve of the Yunnan party in the Chinese Ming court. The Ming emperor then died and the new Ming emperor who came to power was basically backed by the Confucian mandarins or the bureaucrats and they were suspicious of the eunuchs. So because the, they were suspicious of the eunuchs, they began to essentially turn off these, these sources of power of the eunuchs. And so, like good bureaucrats, they switched off the funding to the Chinese Navy. So, 
the eunuchs suddenly found that they could no longer use the navy and the navy then went into sharp decline so the chinese period of naval dominance ended not because of defeat but because of bureaucrats so as i always be very very wary of um uh, pissing off the babus um uh, because if once they turn off the money then even a great empire will rapidly go into decline and so the chinese dominance of the indian ocean basically suddenly disappeared over the subsequent couple of decades and so when vasco de gama turned up in the indian ocean world he, he essentially found a power vacuum the chinese had been there and they had knocked out everybody and then disappeared the majapahit had disappeared the um and the chinese themselves had gone away and it would have appeared that the, the arabs were trying to sort of dominate it again but essentially it was a power vacuum and this is the context in which the portuguese turn up now many often in will wonder sometimes why is it that the europeans particularly a small country like the portuguese were able to take over the indian ocean so very quickly um when this world had existed for thousands of years how were they able to do this uh, after all unlike say the the americas where they were unused to cannons and other you know modern technology um the people of the indian ocean world very quickly caught on to cannons and you know they were very very had they had maritime uh, experience and ships and everything why is it that they so quickly fell apart when the portuguese turned up the reason for that is that the chinese had first been in there and they had knocked everybody else out and then for their own domestic reasons gone away so this is the context ladies and gentlemen in which european dominance of the indian ocean took place now with that i'm going to now stop because the story subsequent to the arrival of the europeans is much better known and i'm sure uh, there is a lot of interesting q and a that we can have thank you very much